Next Chapter Podcasts presents the Play On Podcast series, King Lear. Episode 4, Storm Still. For the best listening experience, be sure to use headphones or earbuds. Just look with your ears. Edgar, I no longer am. Edgar, I no longer am. Edgar, I no longer am. Go while you have the good advantage of night. Surrender, brother, to thy father. Give me a light here. Run, brother. Light! I need light! I heard them proclaim me to be an outlaw, and I was lucky to escape those hunting me by hiding behind the trunk of a a tree. There is no port or road that is not heavily guarded with eyes looking to capture me. I plan to take on a dirty disguise. I'll be the filthiest, lowliest beggar that poverty ever inflicted on a man. I'll smear my face with filth, wear a loincloth, make my hair tangled into knots, and half naked will I confront both wind and rain. I've seen in this city mad beggars who, with roaring voices, stick pins, spikes, nails, and sprigs of rosemary into their bare arms. Poor Tom the Vagabond, Bump, Derelict, Transient, Hobo Joe. What do they call themselves? <sighs> yes, I will be quite the beggar. <sighs> Therefore, Edgar, I no longer am. I am now Tom. Poor Tom. Tom, I am. Who's over there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir? Find somebody from the house. It's strange that they should leave their home and not answer my letter. My king... I heard that, as of last night, they had no intention of adhering to your rules. Greetings, noble master. Ah, uh, my servant. What? Why do you wear stockings? You, you, you have funny legs. Is this supposed to be as funny as I'm finding it? No, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> but they are not stockings that one would wear, my lord, but rather stockings that are meant to wear one out. Huh? Our man is in the stocks. Horses are tied by the heads, dogs and bears by the neck, monkeys by the loins, and men by their legs. When a man shows too much leg, they lock him up for fear that he will show what hangs above his knees. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, who misunderstood your role as my messenger and locked you up here? It was both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes, I'm afraid. No, no, they would never. Oh, but they have. By Jupiter, I swear no. By Jupiter's wife, Juno, I swear yes indeed, they have. I mean, just look, sir. But they would not dare. They could not, would not do it. It's worse than murder to commit such an outrageous act against a king. Tell me as quickly as you can. How came you to deserve it? Or them to impose this punishment when you were sent from me? My lord, when at their home I gave them your highness letters, before I got up from where I was kneeling to show my respect, there came a stinking messenger. He delivered letters in spite of the fact that it interrupted me, which they then read. Once they understood its contents, they summoned their servants and traveled straight away. They ordered me to follow and wait for their answer, then gave me dirty looks. They met the other messenger here, who I saw had managed to poison my welcome, being the same fellow who was so insolent to you recently, your highness. I drew my weapon against him, and he woke the household with loud, cowardly cries. Your son and daughter took his side and decided that I should be locked up. So shamefully in the stocks, here I lie. If your daughter and Cornwall are as cold as he suggests, then like this one of your troubles are far from over. Fathers who are rich will be treated well by their children, but those fathers that are poor will be ignored by them. 
Despite this, you will have a wealth of sorrows from your daughters, more than you can count in a year. Oh, how this choking feeling clutches at my heart. Get down, you hysterical passion, you rising gutless shame. You belong in the pit of my gut, not in my head. Where is that daughter of mine? With the Earl, sir, inside the castle. Follow me not. Stay here. I am chained to your will, my lord. Say, did you really not commit any worse crime than what you told the king? I told no lies. Tell me, why has the king come with such a small entourage? If you were unrestrained for asking that question, you would deserve it. Explain. All but the blind can see that the king has fallen. When a wheel is running uphill, grab it on the upswing and take a free ride. But when it runs downhill, let go of it or else you'll break your neck trying to wheel it in. Where did you pick up such wisdom, fool? Not in restraints, fool. They've denied to speak with me? Uh. They must be sick, weary, perhaps traveling all night. Uh, but these are mere excuses. These are signs of rebellion and desertion. Go back and fetch me a better answer. Yes, my liege. My dear lord, you know how fiery the duke is. You know how impossible it is to get him to deviate from his plans. Fiery! The man can barely burn a calorie old Gloucester. Gloucester! Pay attention. I will show you how to set the world afire. I will speak to the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them of that. Maybe he is hot with fever, the poor Duke. When one is ill, one forgets all duties for which we need our health. We are not ourselves when, when nature being oppressed commands the mind to suffer with the body. Perhaps I'll hold back. I will control my temper rather than think that the ill man is representing the healthy one. Ah. <sighs> Bring my servant here, and then go and tell the duke and his wife that I would speak with them. Tell them to come to me. Yes, yes, I would like there to be peace in my house. Oh, oh my heart. My hysteria is rising. Calm down, and keep a steady beat, dear drum. It's good for the heart to cry out, Uncle. Like the housewife who yelled at the eels she was putting in her pie, she hit them on the heads with a stick and cried, Down, you naughty fiend! Stay down! And her brother wanted to be kind to his horse, so he buttered its hay. They had eel pie and roasted horse that day. Greetings, Your Grace. Good day to you both. I am glad to see your highness. <laughs> yes, Regan, I believe you are. And I will tell you why. Because if you weren't, I would divorce your dead mother as it would mean she was an adulteress and you weren't mine. <laughs> oh, my good servant is freed. Um, we will deal with that some other time. Beloved Regan, your mm -hmm. sister is nothing. She stabbed me with unkindness like a vulture pecks here. I can hardly bring myself to talk about it. You will not believe how evil she has proved to be, dearest daughter Egan. Please, sir, be patient. It's surely more likely that you have misunderstood her than that she is neglecting her duty to you. How have you reasoned that? I can't imagine that my sister would ever fail to do her duty. Maybe, sir, if she has stopped your army's rowdiness, it was for good reasons and for a good end, which would absolve her of all blame. My curse is on her. Oh, sir... You are old. Most of your life has run its course. You should be ruled and guided by the wisdom of others, people who can see your position more clearly than you. So I ask you to make it up to my sister. Admit that you have wronged her, sir. Ask her forgiveness? Do you understand how that would flout tradition and everything I stand for? What do you stand for? <laughs> no, no, my lord. <clears throat> do not, uh, my lord, do not kneel. Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Old people are useless. Oh. I'm begging you on my knees to please let me have my garments, food, and a bed. Good sir, stop this! 
These are unsightly tricks. Go back to my sister. Never, Regan! She dismissed half my nights, glared at me with dirty looks, and lashed at me with her tongue like a venomous viper going for the throat. May all the vengeance heaven has saved up fall on her ungrateful head. Strike her young bones with lameness. Come on now, sir, come on. May lightning strike her in her scornful eyes. May a rash blister her face and ruin what pinch is left of her beauty. Oh, blessed gods! You'll aim the same curses at me if the mood strikes you. No, Regan. I will never curse you. Your womanly nature will never make you harsh. Her eyes are ablaze, but yours, they are warm and do not burn. You would not begrudge me my pleasures, reduce my retinue, speak rudely to me, cut my rations, and in the end, bolt the doors to my entrance. No, you, you are more respectful of the duties of nature. You, you have not forgotten that I gave you half my kingdom, freely, which reminds me. Who put my man in chains? Someone. Some many have arrived. It's my sister. This confirms her letter, which said she'd be here soon. Lady Regan. Oswald. Has your lady gone or will come? This man is a turd who lounges around basking in the reflected glory of Goneril. The one he follows. Get out of my sight, you scoundrel! What do you mean, your grace? Who put my servant in restraints? Regan, I assume you knew nothing about it. Who's this coming? Good heavens. Fairest sister. Dearest sister. Oh, gods. If you love old men, then take my side in this battle. Hurl down a lightning bolt for my cause. Are you not ashamed to look at me, Goneril? After you have abused me so badly in my old age. Regan, are you taking her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? Why does this offend you? Not everything is an offense just because rashness and senility say it is. I feel my heart is about to cripple. Who put my man in restraints? I put him there, sir. But his behavior deserved much worse. You! It was you! I must ask you, Father, to behave appropriately. If you will go back until the end of the month and complete your stay with my sister and dismiss your nights, then you may come to me. I am not home now, and things are not prepared to give you a proper welcome. Return to her and sack fifty of my men? I'd rather be a beggar. I shall live among the wolf and the owl if that's what I am forced to do. Go back with her! I might as well hop among the frogs in France who took my youngest child without a dowry and kneel before the French throne begging for a franc to keep my poor worthless life going. Go back with her? I'd rather be a slave. No, a pack horse to this detestable stable hand here. It's your choice, sir. I beg you, daughter. Do not make me mad. I won't bother you, my child. Farewell. We'll never meet or see one another again. But you are still my flesh and blood, girl. Or rather, you're a disease of my flesh, which I have to call mine. <sighs> no. You're an unpopable pimple, a plague, a sore. No. No, a tumor corrupting my blood. That's it. <laughs> but I won't criticize you. Let shame come to you in its own time. I won't summon it now. I won't ask the gods to smite you with hell and damnation or complain about you to them. Mend your ways if you can. Get better at your leisure. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan. Me and my 100 nights. Not altogether so, sir. I wasn't expecting you yet, and I'm not ready to give you a proper welcome. Listen to my sister. Those who apply a little common sense to your anger must acknowledge that you are old. And so... <laughs> Goneril knows what she is doing. This is your advice. It's what I think, sir. Why more than 50 followers? Is that not enough? 
Why should you need more? In fact, why do you need half as many? Hmm. The expense and risk itself imply that you should have fewer. How can so many people serve two masters and keep peace in one house? It's rather hard, wouldn't you say? I'd say it's rather impossible. I concur. My lord, why can you not be waited on by my sister's servants or by mine? Why not, my lord? If they did not serve you well, we would certainly punish them. If you want to come to me, because now I feel quite uneasy, I must ask you to only bring 25 of your men. <laughs> I will not accommodate any more than that. I gave you everything. And in good time you gave it. I made you the protector and trustees of my kingdom. And all I asked was that I should have a hundred knights for myself. Why should I have to come to you with twenty-five, Regan? And I'll say it again, my lord. I'll only accommodate twenty-five. Wicked people start to look better when others become even more wicked. Not being the worst daughter deserves a little praise, I suppose. Huh. I'll go with you then, Goneril. Your fifty is still twice her twenty-five, so you must love me twice as much as she. Listen to me, my lord. Why do you need twenty-five, ten or five, to go with you to a house where twice that number have been ordered to serve you? Why do you even need one? Oh, listen to you both speak of need, as if you ever needed anything all your lives. <sighs> Even the poorest beggars have at least something they don't need. If you only allow people to have what they need to survive, then a man's life is as worthless as wind. Oh, grief. May the heavens give me patience. You gods, see me here. See the poor old man as wretched in his grief as he is in frailty. If it's you gods who have turned these daughters' hearts against their father, don't make me such a fool as to take their insolence without protesting. Give me a noble anger. You unnatural hags. I will have such revenge on both of you. You think I'll weep. I will not. I'll go mad before I shed one single tear. No, no, my lord. My king! Let us withdraw. A storm is afoot. This house is small. The old man and his servants can't easily be accommodated. And he's to blame for it. Mm. He's taken himself away from shelter. Therefore, he must face the consequences. <laughs> I'll be happy to keep him in my house. But I won't have a single one of his followers. And I shall do the same. Where is my lord of Gloucester? He followed the old man. But now he's returned. The king is enraged. Where is he going? He called for his transport, but I don't know where he means to ride to. Let him go where he wants. He wants to lead? Then let him lead himself. My lord, on no account are you to beg him to stay. Alas, but night is falling and the high winds are blowing strong. There is no shelter for miles around. Willful men only learn their lessons from the injuries they get in their foolishness. Shut the doors. His attendants are violent men. And I'm afraid of what they might encourage him to do. Especially since he's losing the last of his screws. Shut the doors, my lord. It's dark and a dreary night. Regan's advice is sunshine. <laughs> Come in out of the storm. Besides foul weather. One whose mood is like the weather, troubled. I know you. Where's the king? Out battling the elements. But who is with him? Only the fool who's trying to stitch his wounds with yarns and tickling tails. Sir? 
There is division between Albany and Cornwall. Our spies have noticed both the quarrels and intrigues of the Duke and the harsh treatment of the kind old king. There are already French troops entering the divided kingdom. They are aware of our negligence and have secretly occupied some of our best ports. Soon they will come in. If you trust me enough to hurry to Dover, you will find some people there who will be very grateful if you will deliver an accurate report of the monstrous and maddening sorrow of the king's suffering. Trust when I say that every word I tell you is true. If you see Cordelia, as you certainly will, show her this ring. She will tell you who her comrade is that you don't yet know. Damn the storm! We have to find the king. You search in that direction, I'll go this. The first to find him should call the other. The Play On podcast series, King Lear, was translated into modern English verse by Marcus Gardley and directed by Eric Ting. The cast is as follows. Keith David as King Lear. Bernard White as the Earl of Gloucester. Aldo Billingsley as the Fool. Christiana Clark as the Earl of Kent. Gina Daniels as Goneril. Francesca Fernandez McKenzie as Cordelia. Lance Gardner as Oswald and the King of France. Daniel Jose Molina as Edgar and the Duke of Burgundy. J.D. Mollison as the Duke of Albany and the Doctor. Tramel Tillman as Edmund. Amy Kimwaski as Regan. Rex Young as the Duke of Cornwall. Casting by the Telsey Office, Karen Castle, CSA, and Ada Karamanian. Voice and text coach, Rebecca Clark Carey. Episode scripts were adapted and produced by Marcus Gardley and Catherine Eaton. Original music, sound design, and sound mix by Lindsay Jones. Sound engineering by Sadaharu Yagi. Additional engineering by Daniel Ben Shimon. Mix engineer and dialogue editor, Larry Walsh. Podcast mastering by Greg Cortez at New Monkey Studio. Line producer, Jordan Moore. Managing producer, Robert Cappadona. Senior producer, Miriam Lauba. Executive producer, Michael Goodfriend. The senior manager of business operations and partnerships at Next Chapter Podcast is Sally Cade Holmes. The Play On Podcast series, King Lear, is produced by Next Chapter Podcasts and is made possible by the generous support of the Hits Foundation. Visit ncpodcasts.com for more about the Play On podcast series. Visit playonshakespeare.org for more about Play On Shakespeare. Hear more about the Play On Shakespeare podcast series by listening to bonus content at ncpodcasts.com, where you'll find interviews with the artists, producers, and engineers who brought it all to life. And remember, anyone can see how this world works. Just look with your ears. Mm-hmm.